Good morning. How are we doing? <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> Welcome to the workshop, Caregiver Self-Care. Put on your oxygen mask first. Um, I'm Kathy Nugent. I'm Director of Social Service for Cancer Care at the New Jersey office. And I will be your moderator this morning. This session is designed to be interactive. However, we ask that you hold your questions until Dr. Bevins has finished presenting. When you ask your question, please make sure you speak into the microphone so your questions can be heard. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Margaret Bevins. Dr. Bevins is the Program Director for Scientific Resources in Nursing Research and Translation Science, Translational Science at the National Institute of Health Clinical Center. Her work focuses on the effects of BMT on the caregiver's emotional and mental well-being, as well as physical health and behaviors. Joining her for the question and answer session is Ms. Carly Metzovitz. Ms. Metzovitz is the coordinator of caregiver services at Cancer Care, where she supports caregivers individually through support groups and via community programs and events. Welcome, Dr. Bevins. Good morning, everyone. We're going to get through this and get over to the biscuits or whatever the yummies are over there we got a glimpse of. We were just talking about hunger pains in our tummies. So um, how many of you are caregivers of patients who are undergone transplant? Any survivors in the room? Family members otherwise? So thank you all for being here. And I hope that um, I'm confident that Carly and I will be able to provide some um, resources to you to help you and hopefully also gain some insight from you. We actually gained a lot of insight from um, the session previous to this from some of the caregivers who are willing to share. So we look forward to your questions as well as your comments um, after the presentation. So I'm going to give you some information to um, kind of inspire you to ask some questions and to share some information and, um, and then we'll have an open mic session. So the objectives of today's session are to discuss, as you heard in the introduction, some physical and emotional health, your emotional health and physical health as a family caregiver of someone who underwent a transplant. Um, to discuss some of the common challenges you might be facing and the responsibilities, and I know there are many of them that you juggle. And then to discuss, most importantly, some strategies and tips on how to help you manage the stress of all that you're going through, um, either in, you know, from the transplant or as it fits with other things in your life. Um, this is a slide that just sort of reminds us that serving as a caregiver for someone who underwent a transplant is no easy task. What they went through to receive that transplant was no easy task. And we are doing transplants for more and more individuals every day. Thank goodness, right? The indications for the intervention is, in, is um, improving every year. So there's more and more people eligible. So our procedures are getting better. People are surviving. So we have more and more transplant survivors. And with that, of course, more and more transplant caregivers. And that's why you're here, and we are here to also talk about the impact of that intense treatment on you as well as your loved one. So we know as transplant teams that caregivers are a critical part of our team. And in this, I think everybody can recognize the patient because the all too common line sort of gives it away. Um, but we have two family members here who were engaged um, in the process of helping um, their loved one get through the procedure. Dr. Richard Childs, um, our physician, we have two nurses here to the front, and this is a fellow, um, Dr. Shira Vossen. And so we recognize that caregivers are a, an important part of the transplant process. During the acute phase, it's so obvious because you're sort of in our face, right? We're all together a lot. As you move into the survivorship phase, it doesn't become as obvious every day not for us as the providers, and not for you who are not coming to the transplant centers as often as you might have done during the acute phase. So some things I talk about seem like, oh, well, that was the acute phase, and some things I really, we want to reinforce really do carry into that extended recovery because we know it doesn't go away. And how many of you um, are, so how many of you the recipients that you have cared for are more than 100 days post-transplant? Anyone less than 100 days? So you're more than 100 days. So your hand went up a little late. No, it's all good, Valerie. 
you need your blue, you need your muffin. Add 100 days. Add 100 days. My husband's had two transplants, so. Oh, okay, so you're in a little of both. Yeah. So we're going to go with the more acute one. Okay. So some people are at different phases, and that's, that's understandable. Okay. So a few things that we know. We know that you as a caregiver have a commitment to care. And for that, we are grateful, and I know that your loved one is grateful. Often there's a pre-existing relationship with the patient, spouse, parent, sibling. Um, you could also, we have had a few patients, who don't necessarily have a spouse or someone who can unconditionally commit to the caregiving role, because it is not something you can just do sort of in your free time. Um, and so sometimes individuals are looking outside of their immediate family, but in most cases there is a pre-existing relationship. It's unconditional. You probably didn't sit there and go, well, it's going to really be inconvenient, and you know, if my loved one promises to take me to France when it's all over, maybe I'll do it. No, right? There was just this conditional love that you have for this person, and you were there for them and are there for them every day as they would be for you. Dedication without knowledge. We didn't teach you to be a caregiver before you were asked to be a caregiver. You become a caregiver, and then we start to help you understand that role and what that means. And so you went into this very bravely, and um, for that, everyone is grateful. And we also know that you prioritize the needs of that patient first and foremost. During the acute phase, it seems really obvious because they have obvious needs with medications and they're not feeling well. There's obvious changes in their physical being and their emotional being. But you tend to become less important during that acute phase and regaining your importance and self-identity after the acute phase into the long-term phase is really difficult to do. And so we're going to talk about some tips to make sure that happens. We also know sometimes you do it all by yourselves. Sometimes you have to relocate. You can't necessarily have a transplant in your community. Many people do, but sometimes you have to move. And you're all alone, or you feel all alone. Sometimes you have a lot of team people around to help. It could be other people in the family. It could be friends. It could be um, individuals in your community, if you are in your community. But we know that everybody's different, and sometimes people are, are more alone than other times. We know that it's likely you have competing care um, responsibilities or competing care recipients, my apologies, meaning that you might be caring for your parents if they're aging or a child and a husband. And so it's not always this, oh, I have a caregiving responsibility for my loved one, starts today doing nothing else with my life, it'll end in 100 days. We know that's not the reality, but we have to talk about how to manage and juggle all those priorities. We know it could impact your employment, and we know that you also have your own health to think about. Some caregivers, you know, there was a time when allogeneic transplants specifically, and even autos to some extent, were done for a much younger group. We're transplanting individuals in their 70s. The likelihood that the caregiver of the individual who was 70 years old undergoing a transplant, or even in their uh, 40s or 50s, that that other person has absolutely no issues of their own with their own health is unlikely. And so we need to talk about the maintenance of your health to make sure that you don't get in a position that you're sacrificing your own well-being for others. And that's where resilience comes in. This is a marathon, not a sprint. And so even though sometimes you feel like collapsing and may even do so behind closed doors, or that someone else says, you know, I just don't know how you do it every day. You just be able to say to yourself, I'm not a quitter. I'm going to figure out how to do it well, but I'm not giving up. And I guess, uh, my guess is there's no quitters in this room. You guys are looking for ways to stay in the race, but stay strong, because marathons really go for a long time. Some of the other things that we know is that there are positive things that happen as a result of caring for someone that you love. You reframe your life in many cases. There's acceptance, there's empathy, there's appreciation for the finer things in life. There's connection to family that may not have been as strong in the past. There is a, I can do this, I'm doing something really meaningful. That's a positive self-view of the contributions you're making. And there's reprioritization, because sometimes, let's figure, we don't always pick the right things to prioritize. They're not wrong, but you know, we may choose to do things that 
um, may sacrifice other things. And when we really are asked to step up and care for someone we love, we do learn that, oh, maybe that wasn't the most important thing to spend my time doing. The most important thing is this. The challenge here is, although all of these things are positive, in excess, right, life is about moderation, in excess, some of these can create a more negative adjustment for you. Meaning if you over-prioritize your loved one and lose sight of yourself, or you give so much of yourself to understand their experience that you lose your own self in that, that that's not going to help you be the strongest and most resilient person you can be. We know that our body is built to handle stress. If the bear comes up the mountain when you're hiking, you want to feel that stress because you want to get the heck out of its way. So the fight and flight reaction that our body has as a natural component of stress is important. We don't want to lose that. But chronic stress, the fact that that reaction starts and it stays omnipresent despite the fact that the bear, if you will, is gone, is not okay for our bodies. And so talking about caregiving as a chronic stressor is really helping us give respect to what it's doing to our health and our bodies at large and not just our emotional beings. We know that it's complex. We know that there are multiple signs and symptoms associated with our emotional health that seem most evident. We know that lifestyles change, that you don't do the things that you might have done previously, that you're restricting your leisure activity. You may not be going out quite as much as you used to to catch up with family and friends because you have this other commitment, that you and yourself may be having some health problems such as impaired sleep, which is probably the most common um, issue that is uh, reported to us by caregivers. And again, we know that there are, are physiological changes happening in the body of those experiencing chronic stress. And these are just some of the problems. And again, all of this is not sort of me sort of taking a guess at what some of these issues might be. These are from studies, multiple studies that have been done by myself and others in the field asking caregivers about their experiencing, trying to understand what it is to be a caregiver. I've been one just by a blessing, I will say, the opportunity to care for someone in my family, not a transplant, but an um, aging parents. And so I have some understanding of what it takes, even as someone who studies it, to suddenly be in that role was quite overwhelming. So, and I sort of knew as a nurse what to expect. It didn't help. It's really a challenge that we all have to come together to work on. So again, sleep impairment, most common, fatigue, both physical, and cognitive or mental fatigue, which was something we're starting to learn more about, and they are intimately related. And of course, impaired thinking with that. Feeling alone or isolated, feeling the challenges, marital satisfaction and intimacy. We talk about this with patients often. We haven't made it over to the caregivers as often, and starting to recognize that there is often a partnership for spouses that we need to um, be more um, willing to bring them together to have that conversation. Um, financial concerns, of course, with work balance, and then the challenges from the um, transplant itself, and then the emotional problems that we mentioned. We know that more problems make for more distress, and so wanting to address these problems going forward, and the tips are follow, will follow soon here, um, are really, really important. The pain starts in my husband or wife's, wife or child's lower back, then it travels up his spine to his neck, then it comes out of his mouth into my ears, and that's why I get the headaches. So you guys obviously understand the meaning of that, that, uh, that cartoon. You guys are connected. We're connected with the people we love. We can't deny that. We have to embrace it. But we have to try to understand what that means to our physical beings. Healthy behaviors. We know, I think that's what was going on in that room. They were teaching them to eat well, weren't they? Yeah, it was looking good. Um, so healthy behaviors are important, not just as a caregiver, but as a human being. If we don't take care of our one body that was given to us, it will not make us happy. And you will not have the resilience to keep going on that marathon of caregiving. So what we've learned is that caregivers are very good at cultivating interpersonal relationships and feeling 
socially supported at times, and really figuring out how to find spirituality in this experience. And that's easy to do, sort of being in one place, potentially, or being around people you know. But what is difficult to do and often practiced are the things that we know to improve your overall health, like staying physically active, taking care of yourself by doing stress management activities, and being responsible for your own health at the same time that you're helping them manage theirs. We were talking earlier, stress management. This is, means yoga. This is taking mind, time for mindfulness meditation, finding time to turn off that stress response. With the behaviors such as physical activity, we're talking about kind of working it out, right? Working that stress out so that your body can be in a better place. But all of these things are very important. And I say to all of you in the room who are saying, and I, I joked about this previously, you know, when I talk about yoga, a lot of people go, I am not going to get in those tights. I am not going to get in that position. Um, it's just not comfortable for everyone to think about doing things like that. And that's okay, because it's not required. There are so many ways to do mindfulness activities, yoga-based activities, without sort of being in a big class, being in these funny positions that although they are very helpful, there are ways to modify that so that you can find ways to gain the reward of these activities um, in moving forward. Okay, so now it's time to talk about things we can do or you can do, right, to help because unless you're coming to a center on a regular basis, you're unlikely to have the opportunity to talk to somebody every single day about what you're going through. So this is about self-care. This is about you putting your oxygen mask on first. Nobody at Stewardess is not coming up and putting your mask on for you. You gotta put it on and then you can turn and be the best caregiver there is. But without that self-care and motivation to be strong yourself, then you, end up, you can end up in um, a less than optimal place. Communication. Communication is a really important key to being a good caregiver and to having a good sort of dyadic relationship with your recipient. So this has three components, if you will. It's your communication with them, the care recipient, because you're partners in this. And without finding time to be together, to have discussions and clear expectations about who's doing what is really, it's just going to make it difficult. So making that time, if it's your adolescent son or daughter who had the transplant, it can be even more challenging. If it's your spouse, you have to think about new ways to come together and have these conversations. But having the conversations is really important and, fi important and finding times to be together for that to occur is essential. Communicating with family and friends, using on online resources. Does anybody use Care, um, CaringBridge or care pages or lots of helping hands. So during our discussion, if you want to share some of those experiences, that would be wonderful. These are ways to communicate with multiple people and to give them the opportunity to reach back to you. Because if you don't give them an idea of what's going on or what you need or what might be helpful, as much as they want to help, they won't know how. And so being willing to reach out and let them help is incredibly important because they want to. And even though you might feel guilty about reaching out and having someone do something for you, you have to remember your time will come and you can give back. But right now it's about you. And you can reach out to them for help and then use your energy when you're strong again to give back to them or others. Uh, caring page, wait a minute, it's care pages. Caring Bridge and Lots of Helping Hands, or just three, and we'll, we'll give you access to lots of resources as well. We can talk about more of those. Uh huh. Um, communication also is really important with your health care providers. So you often go in thinking, I've got to make sure I have the skills to do this right. I have to be a competent caregiver, and yes, you do. You have to make sure that you're advocating for your survivor who might need you to take notes or listen or help with specific medication understandings. Whatever that is, that's part of being a caregiver. But it's also about advocating for yourself. 
whether it's with the doctor you're seeing for your loved one in the caregiver partnership or whether it's with your own internist or primary care doctor making sure they understand what you're going through because if you only tell us what's on the surface we can't make appropriate choices to help you so we need you to share with us everything that you're going through and let us help you decide if that's something that you could use additional help with if we know then we can make appropriate referrals for you in the community with other providers it may not be with it's not likely going to be with the transplant team per se it might be with social work in the agency but it could also be with individuals in your community skills training as I mentioned always is important but it may not just be the physical care that you're providing financial planning after a transplant can be overwhelming and so things like that are okay to reach out for us for support as well and there are a lot of resources in the different um, advocacy agencies for those kind of, um, of skills so you can have agency specific opportunities to reach out you can have advocacy organizations as well as faith community and friends so look out not always in to get some help talking about self-care again we want to talk about taking time to be physically active eating healthy adequate sleep and stress management again burning off that stress or turning off that stress is a really important way of trying to keep your body as healthy as possible you need that stamina even if you are one year two years out there are still you're here because there's probably still some dynamics going on that you want to learn to manage but you have to stay well doing so yourself and you know we all go yeah right I'm gonna fit that in because I have so many things going on caregivers are one of the most difficult populations to do intervention work with because they can't find time I don't even think you're second to the military it's another difficult population to study because they're like I don't have time if you don't make time you're going to be forced to take the time and that's not okay you don't want to be unhealthy just because you didn't take some preventative time going forward so develop a routine and be kind to yourself and Carly and I give you permission to do this for your own well-being and I guarantee if you ask your care recipient if you should take time to be healthy and strong for them they would give you permission without hesitation find a routine set a minimum maybe 20 minutes a day maybe you start 10 minutes a day you know maybe it's just walking around the house outside in the yard maybe it's walking around the neighborhood whatever it is and it may not be the same thing every day one day might be physical activity one day might be some just quiet time reading another day might be listening to music another day might be going to the gym another day might be having tea or coffee with a dear friend but every day try to find something and identify an advocate for yourself it's okay that this is hard you're not alone and if you find a friend or someone in the community and sometimes it's a therapist which is absolutely okay to be your advocate they will be there for you please call me every Saturday morning to go to coffee they will do that in case you forget so reach out and then sleep hygiene sleep impairment is probably the most it is the most commonly reported symptom by caregivers almost in excess of that reported by patients because you're probably helping them get to sleep and then you can't get to sleep think about limiting your caffeine not eating large meals before bedtime screens off TV computer off well before bedtime I know you're working late you're trying to get everything done in those wee hours that you have to make these things happen but allow that pre-sleep hygiene to be about you so that you rest and your room should be quiet dark and relaxing it shouldn't be where you do your work it shouldn't be where you uh, have a TV and you're entertaining yourself because that only makes it more difficult for our bodies to find that place where they can rest what else can you do to be to find help for yourself so therapeutic counseling is not a bad thing we're an advocate here the key to stress management is knowing how to vent your frustration now some people are not interested in going to a therapist but a support group might be okay so whether it's finding one-on-one -on -one counseling whether it's going to couples counseling which is also highly recommended or group counseling whatever might work for you please reach out and let that be one of the sources that bring you strength focus on the problems that you're dealing with 
our emotions often cloud our ability to actually take care of the absolute thing. The absolute thing might not be that difficult to manage, but the fact that it's the tenth thing in the week or the day makes it hard. So helping somebody, uh, helping yourself think, is it the emotions that I'm struggling with here, or is it just getting it done, which might take 10 minutes? So learning how to think about those two, two things can be helpful. And then spiritual growth, faith communities, and learning to find meaning in the chaos of our life. It's very hard, and we often need help. But when you're there, it really does give you um, the, uh, one more element of strength to move forward. At the NIH Clinical Center, the NIH Clinical Center is the hospital of the National Institutes of Health. We have um, an, an actual hospital on our campus, 250-bed facility. And we made this website a couple years ago that doesn't necessarily have, we don't create the resources per se for caregivers, but we link our caregivers to all the resources that are out there, many of whom are here today as advocates. So our website, we have agency-specific resources, so will your agency. So if you're at the NIH, these are things you can come to our library where we have caregiver resources. There are other federal agencies that have caregiver resources. And so you can reach out to all of them. Some of them are around the more common practice of caregiving for the elderly or those who have um, Alzheimer's disease. It doesn't mean they won't work for you. So reach out and look at the different resources to see what works for you. And then, of course, there are a lot of online caregiving advocacy groups have websites, and we have about four pages of these actually on our website. Um, these are just the A's. And so um, that's just one way we've brought all the resources in one place for caregivers to find what is individualized for them. And with that, I just, I'll end and we'll have our discussion. Um, I just empower you to use every opportunity that you have or every encounter with someone in the healthcare field to be an opportunity to share what's going on with you, to ask for resources, to not feel alone because you are not alone. And let us help you understand what you're going through and find ways to be stronger. So with that, we'll Thank take you, questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, now we will take questions. And we ask that you speak into the mic. I call myself the caregiver extraordinaire. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because many years ago in college, I helped for a week during a vacation, an aunt passing away from um, cancer. Then when I graduated from college, my uncle, I actually went to the house and helped at night, kind of in-home hospice. Then my dad had pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. Then my husband got multiple myeloma. Then I care gave for my mother who had two forms of dementia. <laughs> had to move her. And then my husband got diagnosed with AML in December and just finished um, an aloe transplant. And he also has MDS, so I kind of know the drill. But I have to say, I mean, I really engage in more of the alternative, the acupuncture, the massage, the yoga, the meditation. But when he got diagnosed with the AML, it just, you know, put me over the edge because he did not think he wanted to go through with another transplant. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, well, you're going to have to accept my decision that he's going to die in a year. So I spoke with the oncology social worker because I was just not coping at all. And she said what I was going through was called anticipatory grief, mm -hmm. which I'd never heard of, which is instead of dealing with the day to day, I was constantly thinking of what if, what am I going to do, what's going to happen. And she recommended, and I finally broke down because through all the other, you know, family issues, I never relied on medication. And she recommended a very low dose of Zoloft. <laughs> and I have to say, it really, it just helped take that kind of panicky anxiety. I'm not happy that I'm on it, but with the low dose, it's really, really helped. And, and I keep doing my exercise and all the other things, but just kind of throughout sometimes we have to rely on a little pharmaceutical mm -hmm. <laughs> and not alcohol and not any of that, but yeah. Right, and that's why these things exist because 
we recognize, healthcare providers recognize that sometimes you can only do so much. And so sometimes being able to take something to lift the bottom can be a real relief for people. Mm -hmm. So thanks for sharing that. I don't know if other people have had this experience that are post 100 days, but my wife's transplant was two and a half years ago. And during the acute phase of it, it was easier to be the caregiver mm -hmm. because there was that clear ability to jump into that role and do everything and take over everything. And everything included being in the hospital every day with her and sleeping there and giving up my job temporarily and taking care of our aging parents and doing, you know, two homes, whatever, doing what I had to do. But once she came home and for the first eight months after she was home, it was pretty tough, just all of the side effects and dealing with going back and forth to Sloan. Now that we're at that two-year mark and she's rediscovering and, and re-energizing and kind of coming back into herself, we're finding that just finding the balance back again in the relationship and giving up, for me, some of that caregiving role, you know, and I've also been through this more times than I want to share. And also, I'm a clinical psychologist, oh. you know, mm -hmm. who maintained a private practice, gave up working in the schools, but, and she's a social worker. Mm -hmm. So you have two mental health professionals in the same relationship. So finding that balance, and I think that for those of us who are caregivers in our lives, in our professions, finding the balance again to being human and needing to be able to recognize the impact is also just exponentially more difficult. But I wonder if other people are finding that mm -hmm. as time goes out mm -hmm. from the transplant itself, that reprioritizing the relationship and getting back to being partners mm -hmm. as opposed to being, you know. I want to share a quote. Um, the NIH Clinical Center had a survivorship meeting just Thursday and Friday. Thursday was the science and Friday was the survivors. We had a little over 120 um, allogeneic survivors in the last 20 years of our program come and we've gathered and the, it was all, all the presentations were by the survivors and the keynote survivor is an allo transplant um, recipient about five years out and caregivers actually got a lot of attention. All the, the survivors kept mentioning the caregivers and they actually spoke as well. But he said something that really struck me and I think struck everyone in the room to the caregivers. He said often we, um, we're told um, don't just stand there, do something, right? That's sort of what we remember our parents telling us or sort of ingrained in us as people. He said, let me give you permission to don't just do something, stand there. And I thought that was really powerful because you're right, in that acute phase, there's all these things that you really need to do. That's your job while you're a caregiver. And then it's hard to give them up because it does become part of our identity, right? We transition into the role of caregiving and having a successful transition out is really challenging. Um, but everyone faces it. It is the normal reaction. But remembering to stand back as much as you can, and sometimes it takes a lot, um, will hopefully help as well as you both create your new identities. And you can't not go forward without this defining who you now are. Um, you, you don't lose that. Hi, my name is Ruth. I just wanted to mention some of the resources that I had found easy to access and some of them that I had not. Um, one thing, and I mentioned this in the um, little networking group we had last night, was that I found the Gildas Clubs to be very helpful um, for anybody that lives around here, which I do. There's one in Newark, there's one in Hackensack, and there's one in Chelsea in the, villi in the village in New York City. I think there are some other ones in Manhattan or the Bronx or something. But, um, you know, like I went to a caregiver support group at the Newark one just like a week ago, and Debbie Vincent gave me a whole pot, pile of, you know, literature, including telling me about this conference, which I really didn't know was going to happen. So in addition to giving emotional support, you know, because there's a support group there, they have, like, a lot of resources. And they seem to be good at coordinating, and they seem... which. Actually, um, 
The thing I find lacking in general is people that actually can coordinate the resources because you can find a million websites, you know, you just go from one list of resources like you showed us to another. But for people that actually know what these resources do, um, that's harder to find, you know, like, because they give you a list of ones and you go through 10 and find that they're just very general and they're nothing to do with what you're really looking for. Um, I had been in therapy for a long time, like up until about 2000, and then I, with issues having to do more with getting into projects in the world, and I kind of was doing that okay for, you know, 20 years or so, and then, you know, this, my parents started having problems and then my partner did. So now I, I decided to go back into therapy. And looking for a therapist with a limited, out-of-date list of who they give you on Blue Cross. Um, and actually finding out what the people do, once you have the list, finding out what they do. Most of the, like the insurance companies don't seem to list what the different people do. They, show, they give their name and contact information and whether they take new patients and what insurances they take. But they don't say what they specialize in, what they look like. So then I, you know, did like a major research program project of like looking up, I don't know, maybe there were 30 or 40 on the list. Most of them were out of date. Some of the, I guess I narrowed it down to about 10 that actually you could find information on what they were like and what kind of therapy they did. And I finally did find somebody that I'm going to meet. But um, one thing I found... I mean, there are social workers connected to hospitals, but they don't seem to know private therapists that have experience with this whole caregiver cancer thing. And I guess it's kind of a general thing that maybe anybody could help with, but it might be nice to be able to, if somebody could tell you, oh, this person and that person lives in your area and has your insurance, you know, that would be a good thing. The other area, which maybe this is more about something I haven't been that good in in general, but... You know, they, when you have a transplant, they give you these um, amazing requirements of how clean your house is supposed to be. And, and they say, say, you know, if you can't do it yourself, call somebody. And then, you, and then, you know, you really talk to them. There's the written description of how your house is supposed to be. Then you actually talk to your doctors and they say, well, you know, just get, give it a general cleaning and don't worry about it. And, you know, it leaves you in massive confusion. You know, you read this stuff and you say, oh, my God, I've been using sponges. Sponges collect germs. <laughs> Should I get rid of my lifelong thing of using sponges to wash dishes? You know, and they say, you know, like, get, get a dishcloth and, and put it in the laundry every day. And, you know, like, they, they don't keep track of cleaning people who, like, say you're going to, I did actually hire, I've never hired anybody to clean before in my life, but I hired somebody like these two women came for a, one day to get me started and um and I thought they were pretty good but like nobody there wasn't really a way to find people that know how to clean your house in preparation for a stem cell right. transplant mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> so, so anyway that's just a yeah. few things I was going to say clearly there are some gaps in terms of resources but there are a lot that are out there just sort of off the top of my head, of course, my experience is in oncology. So for anyone whose loved one had a transplant as a result of a cancer diagnosis, there are some resources uh, that exist sort of in that niche. Um, my Cancer Circle is one website, Help for Cancer Caregivers, the American Psychosocial Oncology Society. Um, yeah, and I can, we can certainly talk after for some of these too. Um, sure. Okay, so one is mycancercircle.org. Another, help for cancer caregivers.org. And the American Psychosocial Oncology Society. Now, I know those are kind of specific if you're not dealing with a cancer diagnosis, but um, they're often good starting points. Even if um, the diagnosis or disease state is unrelated, they might at least give you a little bit of direction. Um, the last one that I mentioned, the American Psychosocial Oncology Society, really does a targeted search for therapists, uh, whether it's a social worker, psychologist, psychiatrist, nurse, who has experience in working with people affected by cancer, transplant, 
um, things like that, caregiving. Mm -hmm. So those might be some helpful starting places, but the bottom line is we need to hear from the caregivers about what resources aren't out there so that we, the healthcare providers, the medical teams, anyone who's an advocate can really work to try and make those resources available. Mm -hmm. So it's helpful to us to hear what you're not getting so that we can work to implement those. So thank you. The other thing I would remind you to think about is um, employee assistant programs. So if anybody's still working, many agencies do have um, um, counseling services available in the workplace and they are becoming more and more um, understanding of the burden of caregiving on their employees and trying to put resources in place. And of course, that's very broad statements. There may be nothing in your particular um, employment agency, but if you are in a larger agency, that might be another place to go to look for help. I just wanted to add, I guess, um, just a lot of what's been said resonates, um, in particular, your comment, uh, Kara, right, <laughs> um, about just being a caregiver. I also professionally am a social worker and work caring for my husband during all of this. Um, and I guess I just want to say a piece about what I, you know, I'm an advocate professionally and I work in healthcare, so I knew how to navigate the system very well. Hospital settings, home care, you name it. And I can speak firsthand from being able, having all of that already in my professional background, how incredibly difficult it was to navigate these websites not the logistics of the website per se, but each of these programs, I was looking for financial assistance, for example, and every program has different criteria. Mm -hmm. They all have different application processes. And I was able to do it, but in large part when I kept reflecting because of my expertise, if you will. Um, and I guess my comment would be, in all the things that we're doing, to have, I have, what, how do I put this? I guess I have particularly high expectations for my peers mm -hmm. in that role and was often failed. We had three social workers within one center. Um, and I would just say to others to continue to advocate through those mental health professionals within the organization. And being at a top cancer institution where he was treated, I was literally handed a list of resources. When I went, I, we met with a social worker. I sought her out because I knew what she had the capability of doing. And this isn't to diss our profession because I feel obviously very strongly about it, but it's more just to really advocate through those individuals because I felt, all right, I got the list, but I ended up calling and doing all the work, and which I could do, and many in the room could do, probably taking a little bit more time. But I, I think a lot more has to be put back, to be honest, on the professionals. I understand they're busy. I'm busy too. I, I, really, I have very little sympathy because I'm, I'm doing it. And to me, then, you put in the extra hour, you, you spend the time with that given patient to do what you got to do for them based on what their capabilities are. And that, I, I don't know. I just wanted, a lot of the thoughts resonate, and I wanted to just um, commend everybody, not knowing everybody's story, for, for what you're doing and to continue as best as you can. Channel some of your advocacy to, to give some of that back to the professionals that should be doing what they're doing. Um, and it's easier said than done. My wife's getting nervous. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bill. This is Mary. Our daughter is 28, and she's 18 months post-transplant. Mm -hmm. And I mean, how can I explain this? In, in, in some ways, I'll speak for myself, but I think Mary feels similar. We feel like we have PTSD. It's like when, when she was in the acute phase, we were both very strong because we had to be. We didn't want her to see us upset. You know, we were very focused, test-driven. You knew what you had to do that day to get through. And now here we are 18 months later, and, I mean, speaking for myself, I, I still don't sleep. I mean, I don't, I don't think I've slept through the night since she was diagnosed. And, you know, not knowing what the future holds for her kills me. And, I mean, that's where we're at or where I'm at. You agree? I'm doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> And, have to start talking. No, and, and, <laughs> and believe, it's not every day. Uh, and really, at this point, there's more good days than bad days. That's right. No, there are. But there's like certain days where, like I said, and I was never a crier. And, uh, but there's a certain days where I'll just, not in front of anybody, but 
I'll just lose it, you know. And but it's it's a process, and we're getting through. But I was just curious if anybody else felt that way. I think I think just expressing yourself, um, your wife felt as much sort of reward I think in seeing you be able to say that. I, I think continue to do what you're doing because you just said that you were having more good days than bad now. That means that the journey you're on is going in the right direction. Um, and by everybody's recognition of the challenges you're facing just shows you that you're not alone in this and you're not, it's, uh, you're, it's, it's normal. Um, but just don't get stuck in the suffering allow yourself to continue to find the better days and um, and you're doing it sounds like you're doing everything well congratulations it's hard hi I'm Sharon Verbaker I just can't thank you enough for having this particular session and um, having realized that the last circumstance is my husband's having a stem cell transplant that did not work and now using experimental chemo and the experimental chemo um, has added a second condition for right now. Nothing in order to see what his own body will do. But um, I had shared in our group number 10 yesterday that I do realize that um, I have grown up since childhood, which was <clears throat> being elderly enough to be a World War II child and parents uh, in the military, uh, all females at home, born into that family system where even as a toddler, I thought I needed to take care of the adult females in order for all of us to survive because of their emotional health. And it didn't take until my 40s to realize that I needed to work on some of adult child of alcoholic issues. It was at the same time that I had a daughter um, diagnosed with MS. Uh, learned a few years later that she had a second diagnosis, which was genetic. All three of her siblings have it. Both my husband and I have recessive genes mm -hmm. for that same thing. So life has continued to bring me to the fact, and it's from rooms like this, where I learned that teachers like myself, nurses, social workers, and anyone in religious or spiritual life have a tendency to just have such a natural tendency to care for others. And putting ourselves first is, it's, um, it's an unknown. It's an absolute unknown. The gift of this gentleman behind me, speaking as a male and talking about feelings is so important because two and a half years out, past that immediate need to be all things to everyone, and watching my, and I had friends who would say, Sharon, you cannot do what you're doing. And one of the next names I was given several years ago was Sister Mary Sharon Perfect. <laughs> um, and I thought it was, it was a real compliment, you know, and it was um, a friend who was in the field, and um, but it took years to realize that that was a strength taken to excess and that I was diminishing myself and not a good caretaker to anyone because I wasn't dealing with old emotional issues that I didn't even know I had. Mm -hmm. Never knew how to learn to be angry in an appropriate setting like today and look at where you're a professional in the field and be disappointed naturally when you're not getting the help that you feel you need from your peers. And so I really had, um, coming here, I wasn't certain what would be good for me in terms of caretaking. But when I walked in, I thought, I will leave him at the door. Because one of the things he is saying now is, I don't want to be hovered over. Mm -hmm. And finding that balance between hovering, but maybe just sitting there with him while he's taking a nap, giving myself permission to get the nap. When our children call with all of their health issues to realize they are adults, they're scattered across the country, they have to find their own doctors and do everything that they need to do with their blood work, and that I, Sister Mary Sharon, perfect, cannot be scattered 
and with grandchildren, um, <clears throat> just taking good. So this morning I thought I was going to be at the 8.30 meeting. Well, you know, the, nothing was written for the, and I thank you to the lady who's cleaning the room. Uh, there were, so instead of going to spiritual and healing at 8.30, I had an hour by myself oh, to good for you. <laughs> write the thank you, be ready for my husband to take stuff out to the car by 9.30 and get to this one. But truly, um, one of my favorite sayings from the 12-step room is, any expectation is a premeditated presentment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I have them all the time, and I watched that Friday before we came here. All of a sudden, in my head, I needed to know all kinds of things. Did he sign up for food? Did he... And he's just trying to get healthy enough to come for the first time, be willing to listen to other people's experiences, find out what he can do, to pass it forward for himself. Mm -hmm. And I run a 24-7 hotline, also for family members, of suicide. And someone said, oh, Sharon, oh. after 15 years, that's your baby, you created it, but it's time to let go. Do you know, I? that is the hardest thing to do, to just let go and take good care of yourself and what you shared in terms of there will be time to give back. Mm -hmm. The guilt that I have after three corneal transplants in a week, mm. two months ago, I'm still carrying notes to write thank you notes. And every place I come, I said, there'll be 10 minutes to write a thank you note. Those things have gone across the country four times. <laughs> no thank you notes are written. But you gave me permission today to say, it's OK. They'll get written in time. And I'm the only one that has that expectation. Right. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So the expectation of the premeditated resentment is towards myself yeah. for not doing this perfectly in terms of writing, in terms of time. And so everything that is shared here, but I absolutely, because of the 12 step work that I do do, I'm always so grateful when men mm -hmm. give their feelings. Mm -hmm. And that's what I expect of my spouse. And that's an unrealistic mm -hmm. expectation. He will share whatever he wants to share in these rooms, separate from me. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think my biggest blessing has come. Mm -hmm. Which does each of these apply to me? And then we can share mm -hmm. back home, mm -hmm. but as much information as we can get for each other, um, I think is, and learning that that's not only okay, it's the only way I will keep home. Thanks for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have time for about one more question. Did you I just want to share a real quick, quick story? Goes to what Sarah said. We're we're very, very close to a little great nephew. Um, he's like a grandchild to us. We do activities with him several times a month. And during my husband's illness this winter, he came to the hospital. He was all. But when you look at things through the eyes of a child. It just brought us a lot of joy and laughter. But this summer, unfortunately, there are many things we could not do with them that we normally do. And one day he said, well, Aunt Gail and Uncle Jay, can we do this? We haven't done it yet. And I said, well, honey, Uncle Jay can't do this. Remember, we explained there's some things he can't do. And he said, well, why doesn't Uncle Jay just go back in the hospital for a while and you and I can do it? Like very innocently. <laughs> And, and it's true because my husband developed an infection this summer, he had to go back in and it's, it was, I hated he was in there, but it was easier. <laughs> it's easier. Yeah. 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 Well, you gave yourself permission to do that. Yeah. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody else? Any more? We do have five minutes. Would you like to conclude? Any concluding remarks? Well, I'll just say that I think self-care is such an important part of the process of caregiving. You all obviously mm -hmm. feel that way because you showed up today, and that's definitely a step in the right direction. And so keep doing that. Keep sharing your experience. Keep communicating. Keep sharing what's not working with your medical teams, with the providers, so that we can work to help support you as best we can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for sharing right, so much. You. Thank you.